Okay, great. So we are live. I'm just going to go ahead and um, click start presentation so that whoever logs in can see the um, PowerPoint. Okay, great. So it's up there. Um, we have eight participants so far. We had, last time I checked, around 90 people registered. Um, so there may be a little bit more joining us tonight. I'm gonna go ahead and give everyone maybe one more minute before we get started. Not too much time, because I know we have a lot to cover. And then um, for my speakers, once again, if we if you get disconnected, feel free to just call me during your part and we can always put you on speaker if anything, okay? What's the best number, just in case? Um, I'll go ahead and email it to you all again. Okay, I'm sure I have it. I just resent it. There you think. All righty, we're going to go ahead and get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Um, we are live. You're tuning into Futurology's Military Academies webinar. And um, my name is Jennifer Monsonetis. I am one of the um, college and career counselors for Futurology um, with CUSD. Um, we're gonna go ahead and take a quick moment to um, ask if you all could please share your name and um, high school, or you could just share your high school and grade level in the chat box on your right-hand side. We like to see who's tuning in. So again, you can share your high school and grade level just so we can get a sense of the crowd joining us tonight. Hey, Tanya, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. Is Jennifer hear. on? I am on. I don't have her video. Um, my camera is on. Can everyone else see me? Yep, I can see. Can you all hear me as well? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Um, Han, maybe if you could try logging back in again. Can you see everyone else? Han? I don't think he can hear us. Oh, no. Han, can you try logging, um, getting out and going back in? Han, can you try getting out and going back in? Okay. 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 Thanks, Thanks, Tanya. Um, all righty. Well, we have a lot of people joining us tonight. Um, San Juan Hills is in the building um, or in the webinar. We've got Tesoro representing, um, Aliso, Dana Hills here, San Clemente. Great. And a good mix of greats. Rex is here. I'm glad you made it to the webinar, Rex. Awesome. All right, well, thank you all for participating in the chat. We're gonna go ahead and move on now. Um, the chat box is also where you will be asking your questions tonight, um, which you will go ahead and do at the end of our webinar during our Q&A portion. So go ahead and save those till the end. Um, now, before we begin, I would like to ask a quick favor. If you haven't already, please go ahead and scan the QR code um, for those students um, tuning in so we can get a sense of you know, where you're at before the webinar starts. Thank you in advance to those of you who have already filled it out. I did see your responses. Um, so I'm gonna give you all a quick minute to go ahead and fill this survey out. It's very, very short. For those of you not familiar with QR codes, if you open your camera on your iPhone, for example, it'll um, open up a link and you can click on it and fill out the quick questions. Thank you. 
All righty, another second or two. Thank you again for those of you who took the time to fill it out. Really appreciate it. We're gonna go ahead and move on to the next slide. Um, before we do begin, I would like to introduce our program very briefly. Um, for those of you not familiar with Futurology, we are a free college and career counseling program with Capistrano Unified School District. We offer workshops, um, webinars, um, presentations throughout the year. We help coordinate the district-wide college fair. And in addition to all that, we do also do one-on-one um, -on -one appointments in both English and Spanish to support our students with their college and career planning process. Um, you're more than welcome to schedule an appointment with us. Um, currently, they are virtual appointments, um, but we're hoping in the fall we'll be back to face-to-face um, -face in-person appointments again. Um, currently, our appointments are limited to high school students. So any of the young students joining us tonight, um, please um, look out for upcoming events and previously recorded webinars on our website. All righty. Hey, let's go ahead and get started. So originally, my plan was to have representatives from each of the five academies join us um, tonight, but that wasn't, uh, unfortunately, that wasn't possible. Um, but lucky for us, we are able to have a few reps from the Naval Academy join us and a couple from West Point who will be um, guiding us through the application process of the military academies, along with highlighting um, the nomination process and providing additional information. Um, this webinar is meant to be a general guide to the military academies and the application process so students understand the different pieces of it. There are subtle differences between each one. So I do recommend that you do your research further to see which would be a um, good fit for you. Um, however, joining us tonight is a great start. So glad to have you all with us. Uh, in the fall, I hope to facilitate another opportunity for students to connect directly to um, college admissions officers or representatives from the military academies. So please stay tuned to our website. Um, hopefully we can make that happen in the fall um, when things are a little less crazy. Um, now, as you can see, I'm not the only one here. Uh, these friendly faces uh, down at the bottom are my guest speakers. So allow me to introduce them. Um, first up, we'll be hearing from Alex Pycook. You can give a little wave, thank you. Um, he is the fifth Battalion Executive Officer at the U.S. Naval Academy and currently finishing up his senior year there. Next up, we will hear from Lieutenant Yi Chan Kim, who is also the um, California Admissions Counselor for the Naval Academy, and he previously flew helicopters for the Navy. Um, Lieutenant Kim, if you could just give a quick wave if you didn't already. Awesome. And our third speaker, I hope you can hear me, Han Nguyen, if you can give a quick wave. Um, he will be, can you see, can you hear me, Han? Yes, I can hear you. Okay, perfect. I was a little worried there. Um, he is a West Point grad and served in the um, Army as a military intelligence officer. During his time in the Army, he was responsible for testing and fielding various intelligence collection and communication equipment. Um, he later earned an MBA in management from Western International University. And after leaving the military, um, worked as a management consultant for five years and currently is an investor and owner of several businesses. Um, afterwards, we will have the pleasure of hearing from Tanya Presser, who is the U.S. Naval Academy graduate, um, UCLA Anderson School of Business MBA grad, former Navy commander and currently working for Takeda Pharmaceuticals in their rare disease plasma business unit. She's also part of our CUSD community as a parent within the district. So if Tanya, you can give a quick wave. Thanks again for joining us. Um, and lastly, we have the privilege of hearing from Amy Slaughter, who is a current West Point graduate and first Lieutenant Army Engineer Officer and current admissions officer at West Point. So once again, on behalf of CUSD, I'd like to thank all my guests for um, taking some time to share your insight with us. 
So as I mentioned, our webinar tonight will focus more on the military application, um, military academy application process. However, it's important to clarify um, the different pathways students can take if they're interested in the military. Thanks again for those of you that submitted your questions ahead of time. Um, so first off, students can enlist right after high school um, where they would go to, straight to boot camp. There's no college application required. Um, you don't need to attend college. Um, there um, you will go ahead and start your training in a specific trade, which will automatically prepare you for your job in the military. Um, and this goes for the armed forces, whether you know it's Army, Marines, Navy, whichever route you end up desiring to take. Um, the second pathway you can take is pursuing ROTC, which stands for Reserved Officer Training Corps. Um, this allows you to attend what you would call like a regular college, such as ASU, uh, UC Santa Barbara, Oregon State. Um, those are just a few, for example. Um, they allow you to participate um, while you're in college. And um, you have military training primarily in the summer. So you have more of a part-time military experience. Um, you do need to uh, apply for an ROTC scholarship from the different services. If you're interested in that route, then you apply to the, the college and accept a spot in their ROTC program. So it's a little different in that regard. Um, some students do um, participate in ROTC all four years, whereas others decide to just um, participate some of their years. So they receive partial scholarship. Uh, once you graduate, you are an officer in the armed services and um, are then required to serve for four years. Um, the third option, which is, again, what we'll be talking about tonight, is the military academies option, which includes West Point, uh, the U.S. Naval Academy, U.S. Air Force, U.S. Coast Guard, U.S. Merchant Marine Academy. These are all four-year colleges where you are immersed in the military life. Right. This is an everyday experience. Um, these um, colleges are all tuition free for all four years. You're expected to wear uniform more than once a week um, and <laughs> every, you, day. <laughs> every day for the most part. Yeah. Um, you take regular courses along with military courses and learn about military leadership. And you do owe five years of service upon graduation and are commissioned um, as an officer after graduation. Um, but one thing I did want to highlight, the main difference between ROTC and military academies is I want to emphasize the lifestyle, right? Um, because, again, in a regular college, you'd have your regular dorms, right? Um, you, you'd have, like, that different college experience, whereas a military academy, you are pretty much self-contained in a military campus where, again, every single day is a military experience. So that's definitely something that you want to keep in mind. Okay, so before we dive into, oh, um, can you all, okay, we're gonna go ahead and do a quick poll here. So if you can go ahead and look at your right hand side, answer the following question. Which of the following academies was founded first? Go ahead and feel free to answer. Take a wild guess. Oh, there we go. I had to publish the poll. Sorry. Go ahead and uh, take a wild guess to see which of the academies was first founded. Awesome. I see some people responding. <laughs> and a lot of people have already guessed it. Correct. That's so interesting. That's exciting. Okay, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll now, okay? Okay, so um, for those of you that guessed the um, United States Military Academy West Point, 72% of you guessed that. You're correct. That was, <laughs> that is the very first one to be founded. Um, good job. You all know your stuff already. Um, okay, so we're going to go ahead and go back to the slide here. Okay, if I can direct your attention back to the slide. Okay, thanks for participating. Um, so there are five federal military um, service academies or 
as we've been calling it in this webinar, military academies. Those two are kind of interchangeable. So there is the United States Military Academy at West Point. There's the, um, and I'm listing these in order, the United States Naval Academy, United States Air Force Academy, um, the United States Merchant Marine Academy, and the United States Coast Guard Academy. Um, Army, Navy, and Air Force are often referred to as like the big three, um, partially due to their size and their D1 sports. Um, the Merchant Marine Academy and Coast Guard are smaller, but they do offer incredible opportunities and should be considered as well. Um, with a few exceptions in specific sports, the, those two are considered D3 schools. And um, one thing I do want to highlight, um, because a lot of people often forget about um, this one, is um, the biggest difference between the Merchant Marine Academy and the others is that they provide the flexibility to choose um, to students, right? They provide the flexibility to students to choose their different method of service um, after graduation into any of the armed forces. So that's something to note. Um, but an appointment to one of the five service academies um, is an unparalleled educational opportunity for the right student, right? Um, applying to an academy isn't like other colleges, which you'll learn about momentarily. And the application process can be a little daunting, but it's not impossible, which again, you'll hear from our reps in a, in a moment. Now you may be thinking, okay, well, why why attend a military academy, right? Why, why do students choose to go that route? Well, the academies are, think of them as the ultimate co-op, right? You get hands-on career training from day one and you're guaranteed a job after graduation. Um, all students receive a bachelor's of science degree and tuition is free. And in addition to that, you're commissioned into the armed forces at graduation, which is pretty awesome. Um, in addition, students do receive a monthly stipend uh, with the exception of Merchant Marine Academy, which only provides a stipend during your two years at sea or the, your time at sea. Um, students get holiday breaks, short summer vacations. However, training does occur year round for all four years. The academics consistently rank nationally for academic experience, committed faculty, excellence in fields such as engineering, business, and leadership development. Um, and every single student will be challenged in some way, whether it's through academics, military training, or athletics. Um, for some, it is a combination of all three. Now, the military um, academies is a great experience for students who want to get a first class education. Oh, there we go. I forgot to change the site. Um, but keep in mind, it is important for you to pursue this path if this is what you want to do, what you truly want to do. Not what your parents or family members want for you, okay? Because at the end of the day, you'll be the one doing the work. You'll be the one going through this experience. And again, this goes for any college or whatever path you take. Make sure it's something that's true for true to you and what you want, um, which you'll hear us say over and over. You know, is it a good fit for you? Now, for students tuning in right now, I, I want you to ask yourself um, some of the following questions, okay? Are you a leader in the classroom or in the field, the court, or in your community? Are you a person that your teachers could trust to leave the classroom alone with? Um, maybe are you a go-getter who needs little direction or follow-up? And mostly, um, are you a leader of character? Because in the military, your word means everything. Um, as an officer, accountability begins and ends with you. So um, keep in mind, you know, officers are expected to do the right thing, even when no one's looking right? They're highly motivated, selfless, work well in teams, and always give it 110%. So now you may be thinking this is a lot to ask of a student, right? But if you identify with any of those things, it's definitely a good idea to consider applying. All righty. Now let's go ahead and take a moment to hear from current senior at the U.S. Naval Academy, Alex Pycook, to see where his interest for the academies began. Alex, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Great. Okay. So, 
Go ahead, Alex. Basically, my interest in the academies first started around freshman year of high school. My dad came up to me and was like, hey, you should start looking into this academy. At the time, I was like, there's no way. I'm not doing that. It's not happening. Later on, it was about junior year of high school, and I was approached by Navy's water polo coach, and he was offering me recruitment and tried to recruit me. So I decided to look more into it, looked into it and actually realized what an awesome deal it was. And I went, visited the campus on a visit and just fell in love with it. Um, from that point on, I was just sold. I watched all the YouTube videos of Pro Tramid. If you haven't seen that, it's pretty cool to look at. And just being able to fly planes over summers and you can drive an aircraft carrier. Not many other schools can really tell you that. Awesome. And um, can you share with us um, what an average day or week kind of looks like for a student in the Naval Academy? Yeah, of course. So every morning you're going to have formation at 07. You're also going to then have classes after that. You will then have a new meal formation, whether it'll either be outside or inside. And if it's outside, the seniors will have swords and they're going to lead you in formation and march you in. It's like a big show and almost like a parade for people who don't know what it looks like. Uh, after that, you each lunch together. So every single meal you have at the academy, you eat with all 4,000 of your classmates and fellow students at the Naval Academy. So you're going to get that done. You're going to go finish your afternoon classes. You're going to come back. You have a mandatory sports period. So during that time, you're either a varsity athlete or even if you're not, you're still going to be doing a sport and you're going to go do that for that period of time. You will then go get dinner and from dinner to the end of study period, you're going to be working on your classwork, finishing all your homework. If you do all that, you need to go talk to your friends, hang out, have a good time. But during the week, you're not allowed to leave until you're a junior or senior. You can't leave until Fridays. If you're a freshman or sophomore, you can't leave until Saturday, Sundays. Okay, great. So um, social restrictions kind of loosen up a little bit as you get higher up, right? Yeah, with rank comes privileges. There you go. Um, thanks for sharing. Um, this is something we talked about um, previously as well, um, you and I. Can you share a little bit how um, the Naval Academy is a little different from some of the others in terms of like the social aspect? So a big selling point on the Naval Academy is you are in a town. You're not miles away from another town. You can actually walk out and you're in a city. You're 45 minutes away from DC. When you're of age, there's bars that you can walk to. Most of the other academies don't really have that. Still great opportunities and there's still great schools to go to, but that's one really cool thing you can do. And the academy is also almost surrounded by like 75% water. So, you get to go out on the water whenever you want to. It's a great fun time. Okay, awesome. And um, can you share with us your absolute favorite part of being a student there right now? That's hard. Uh, <laughs> honestly, I'd say the friendships that you make over the four years. It's a super cheesy answer, but after four years there, you really learn that the friendships you make there will be for a lifetime, and there's something you really don't get anywhere else. For the most part, you've been through plebe summer, plebe year, and your other three years with these people right by your side, and they know the ins and outs of you. So that's definitely my favorite part is the camaraderie. Definitely a lot of opportunities to um, strengthen those relationships, right? Of course. <laughs> um, and let's see, um, do you have any like tips for students that are interested in taking this route after high school? Maybe things they can start doing now or things to keep in mind? So one thing for me is, as I said earlier, I'm a water polo player. I don't run. So learning to run was a big thing for me because as a male at the academy, the Naval Academy, you have to get a seven minute mile pace for a mile and a half. And that's the bare minimum. So you have to be able to make that. So definitely start running now if you're interested in anything in the military. Okay, great. So you heard it directly from the source folks. Uh, if you're fit, get fitter <laughs> awesome well thanks for sharing some of your experience with us alex um i know you're in finals right now um so that can be a stressful time so some of the students um logging on tonight he's feeling that pressure just like you all right with finals creeping up 
Um, he will be staying for the Q&A portion at the end. Um, so keep in mind that you can still ask him questions later. Um, we're gonna go ahead and move into our next topic, um, preparing for admissions. But first, I'd like to conduct one more poll. Um, if you don't mind, um, actually, sorry, that second poll didn't load. It's all right, we're gonna go ahead and move on to preparing for admissions and we're gonna hear from uh, Lieutenant uh, Yi Chan Kim. Hey everyone, uh, my name is Lieutenant Yechong Kim. Can you guys hear me? Cool. Um, yeah, sorry. Sorry if it's a little awkward. I'm like talking to a bunch of people I can't see. So um, feel free to comment in the chat box um, and ask questions while I'm presenting. Uh, I'll start off with a little bit of background. Um, class of 2014, 2014, uh, graduated, uh, became a Navy pilot, and I just finished up flying my operational flying tour. I did two tours to the Kingdom of Bahrain, which is a little island next to Saudi Arabia, the Arabian Gulf. I flew the MH-60 Sierra, which is the Navy's variant of the Army's Black Hawk helicopter. Um, and now, I, in January, I started my new job, which I'm the admissions counselor for uh, the Naval Academy admissions team for California. So if you choose to apply to the Naval Academy, I'll most likely be looking at your application, reviewing it, uh, and stuff like that. So um, I'm going to be talking about kind of how to prepare uh, for admissions to the Naval Academy. So it looks like we have a good mix of ninth through 11th graders, which is good news. So if you're a ninth grader right now, um, really good on you because preparing early pays dividends down, uh, down the line. So um, kind of talking about uh, admissions, we look at academics, uh, the physical aspect, and then the leadership aspect as well. So um, starting early is good. Um, if you don't play a sport, try to join a sport. And uh, I think being in a sports team for consistency is also very important. So instead of just doing one club or one sport for one year, stick with it for four years and show uh, that consistency and you progressing as well. So if you can, uh, take that leadership role in a club or uh, become the team captain of a sport that is uh, very important and we look at that and we consider that uh, pretty highly. Um, okay, so let's see. Yep, so high SAT scores, ACT scores. So I know that's kind of a, a weird thing right now because of COVID uh, for you 11th graders. Um, we are taking that into consideration for this admission cycle. So. Uh, if you haven't done so, try to, you know, keep preparing as much as you can. And I know that SAT, ACT, they're trying to accommodate right now for the current situation. Um, but we, as of now, it is still a requirement for the application uh, process. All right, if you go next slide. Okay, so the way we evaluate, uh, evaluate you guys for the application process, is we call it the whole, whole person evaluation. So we want well-rounded applicants to apply to the Naval Academy. Um, there are no minimums for SATs or ACTs in four grades, but um, we do recommend that you strive to be in the top 20% of your class. Um, and the reason for that is it, it can be pretty competitive to get into the Naval Academy. Um, and when we evaluate your application, the biggest thing that we're looking for is, hey, can you make it academically at the Naval Academy? Because um, while you're at the Naval Academy, your primary job is going to be a student. You're going to be working towards your undergraduate degree. Everyone uh, graduates with a Bachelor of Science, um, no matter what you, what, whatever you major in. Um, and I got to say, I think academics can definitely be one of the toughest parts of school. Um, we, the Naval Academy was rated the number one top public college by U.S. News for 2020. Um, so in conjunction with all your military obligations, drilling, everyone has to play a sport, um, all these other stressors, and then academically performing as well, it can be pretty challenging. So that's why uh, we do um, emphasize uh, grades and SATs, and we look at that to see if you can succeed academically at the Naval Academy. Uh, secondly, we also look at the physical aspect because being physically fit is a extremely huge part about um, being a military officer, which is the end goal when you graduate from the Naval Academy. Um, 
So in the application process, one of the ways that we evaluate that is through the CFA, which is the Candidate Fitness Assessment. Uh, it's going to be push-ups, sit-ups, a mile run, pull-ups, uh, and a bunch of other exercises. And we basically score that, and you have to pass the minimums in order to be uh, considered in the application process. And we can talk more about that if you have questions down the line. Uh, and a lot of these uh, a lot of this information that I'm talking about right now, um, you can also find on our website, which is um, usna.edu slash admissions, and I'll type that into the chat box uh, later. And the last thing that we're looking for is the leadership uh, moral part, because we want, like I said, the end goal is to produce officers that go into the Navy and the Marine Corps. So we're looking for that capability uh, for you to lead your peers and people below you, um, and we're looking at looking for that through extracurricular activities, positions that you hold in sports teams, um, things like that. All right, next slide, please. Oh, and I did want to add that we'll have a slide at the end with um, the links to all the different academies. Okay, and this will be emailed. The PowerPoint will be emailed to you all after as well. I think I forgot to mention that earlier. All right, so here's some practical advice um, for preparing for the Naval Academy. Um, so we're looking for a strong foundation in math and science, so algebra, geometry, trigonometry, pre-calculus and calculus. Um, take, we strongly recommend that you take those classes um, and chemistry and physics with a lab as well. Uh, like I said, there's no minimum GPA, but strive to be in the top 20% of your class. Um, and the SAT, ACT is still a requirement uh, at this time. Um, so try your best to take it. And if that's not a possibility, you can still apply to the Naval Academy, but you're gonna be working more with the admissions team uh, to work that out. And then AP honors and IB courses, if those are offered at your school, take them because they really um, determine um, if you'll be able to academically succeed at the Naval Academy. And lastly, like I said, we're looking for that well-rounded student. We're not just looking for a student that has straight A's or is physically just, um, awesome. We're looking for someone that can do all of it because it's a, it's a balancing act uh, while you're at school. And then once you graduate from the Naval Academy, you're going to have to, you know, perform in pretty stress-filled environments. And I think that's kind of one of the biggest reasons there's such a huge physical um, emphasis because sports and being physically fit is one of the best ways, I think, to simulate um, performing really well and efficiently in high-stress environments, which once you're in the military, any branch that you're in, you're going to have to operate in those stress-filled environments. So being physically fit and practicing that, I think is one of the best ways to simulate performing in those kind of situations. Um, so yeah, like I said, we're looking for that well-rounded student that can strive academically, physically, and then lastly, the, probably the most important, uh, morally, because we're looking for uh, leaders of character that, that will lead by example. Um, so we're looking for that moral um, piece as well. All right, um, that's kind of what I have for these slides. I know there are a couple of questions about the Naval Academy that were passed before, and I can kind of answer some of those right now, uh, if you want me to, Jennifer. Um, if you want to answer one of them, you can. Um, or but, I could just wait too. Yeah, if we kind of wait till the end, it might be better, because sometimes we get a little off track. Um, okay. But I, I am glad that people are using that chat box and we, we do see them, we'll get to them towards the end, okay, if the answer or the question's not answered just yet. All right. Thank you. Okay, we're going to go ahead and hand it over to um, Han Nguyen now. Hi, um, I'm, as Jennifer introduced me, I'm Han Nguyen. I graduated in 1992 from West Point, so it's been a few years. However, the overall application process is pretty much still the same. Now, I'm speaking primarily for West Point, the application process, but I'm, I'm pretty certain that it's very similar with the, for the other academies. Uh, for West Point, there are three components to the application process. Uh, some of them has been covered previously by uh, Lieutenant Kim. Uh, the first component is the candidate application. Now, with the candidate application, West Point looks, look, looks for a candidate similar to other colleges, such as good grades, high SAT. Um, that's the, uh, it takes about 60% of the application. Um, 
the other 30, 40%, 30% of which is for leadership abilities or potential. So we're talking about um, looking at your, if you participated in a sport, were you a team captain? Um, community services, were you in charge of projects? Um, Eagle, Eagle, uh, Eagle Scout and Gold, Gold Awards for Boys, uh, Boy Scout and Girl Scouts. Uh, additionally, if you're a boys or girls state, that would make it look very favorable for your application. Okay, the remaining 10% of your of the candidate profile is your fitness. And again, if you don't, if you're not fit, get fit. If you're fit, get fitter. So um, the the assessment, the candidate fitness assessment, they're looking at the basketball throw, pull ups. 40-yard uh, run, sit-ups, push-ups, and a one-mile run. Now, these are the minimums for um, in your profile. Now, when, once you get to the academy, you're going to have a totally different um, requirements to, to be fit, fitter and, and continue to be fit throughout your career. Now, in the past, we had several instances where candidates shows up to – the first day of, of um, we call it our day, and they were not able to achieve some of the components of the fitness assessment that they passed previously. So now one of the requirements I, we have to do is we actually have to videotapes all the candidates doing the CFAs, the fitness assessment. So that's the first component of your application process. We're looking at your entire GPAs, uh, your high school transcript, SAT scores, and your CFAs and how you do well there. The next component you need to do is your medical exam. You need to pass your medical exam conducted by a military installation. Now keep in mind to sign up for the exam, it takes about 90 days between signing up and getting it completed and your record getting sent, getting sent to West Point for review. So plan accordingly. You cannot, as a junior, plan to take your, your medical exam on your last month. Uh, uh, for, and I'll give you some, some major dates, uh, deadline for you to, to keep in mind. Now, all this information can be found on the website also. And I just emailed Jennifer, so she will be posting that. Um, basically, the medical exam, make sure you're, you're medically fit to perform physical activities once you're a cadet and eventually be in the Army. And then the last component, which is the most, I think is the most challenging, is to get a congressional nomination. You have to contact uh, a congressman or senator in your district. Um, and you can easily look that up, Google who's your, which which district you're in and you could find your, your congressman. And then they would have a separate application. Each congressional office has a separate application for you to complete um, basically your, your personal information and essay why they should nominate you. So those are the three components in the application process. And it's very important that you meet the deadlines. There are no extensions to it. So to get your application completed, you have to submit your application completed with a congressional nomination by January 31st. And to get your medical exam completed by April 15th. Now those are the two very important dates if you want to get started. You have to get started early in your junior year. Otherwise you will not meet the deadline. Okay? And to get all, all this information is on our website. And to get started, you sign up online through the portal, and on, on from that information, you will be directed to a local field um, um, uh, a reps like myself in your congressional area, and we will help you and coach you to how to complete the rest of your application if you have any questions. That's all I have. Okay, great. Thank you, Han. Um, now going into a little bit more detail regarding the nomination process is Tanya Presser. Hi, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay. 
Um, I was just texting one of the students who's on here right now. Um, she's a volleyball player. She goes, I guess I should start running. <laughs> so, um, <laughs> I just wanted to say for any parents who are participating in this with your students, I am a Ladera mom. I'm coming to you from Ladera. I have two middle schoolers at L LRMS right now. Um, a lot of this sounds really intimidating. I'm happy to, you know, you guys can reach out to me. Um, I meet with your family and just discuss anything. Um, it's really, you know, there is a lot to it, but like when they were talking about pull-ups, I don't know, and I can ask Lieutenant Kim now, but I couldn't do a pull-up when I entered. I We did flex arm hang, so I don't know if that's still the case. I'm hearing yes or no, I'm not sure. Uh, so yeah, I couldn't do a pull-up, I think the whole four years <laughs> when I was there. So that may have changed now for females, I don't know. But um, I, I will say just before I get into the nomination process, like don't be intimidated. Um, I grew up next to Fort Knox, uh, Kentucky, a lot of West Point graduates and um, my parents were divorced. My dad lived in Annapolis and I loved the town. Um, as Alex said, it's just, it's a great place to visit. And, um, I didn't know anything about the military going in. So you don't have to have everything planned out. You know, it's, if you're not sure what you want to do, that's, that's part of going there every summer for the Naval Academy, you graduate as either a Naval or a Marine Corps officer. So you're exposed to different jobs within the Navy, different jobs within the Marine Corps. So you can kind of see what you might want to do upon graduation. So um, I just wanted to share a little bit of that. And as far as sports, uh, they do have intramural sports for those who aren't varsity athletes. Um, I did cheerleading, so totally different. Probably I didn't even know we had cheerleaders when I went there. Um, but you know, there's you don't have to be a varsity athlete um, to be there. So just wanted to, you know, if you're feeling intimidated listening, please don't. Um, there's a place for everybody. Okay, so on to, the, and I did serve for 20 years and retire, so I retired as a Naval Commander. Um, so I can answer any questions about that afterwards as well. But as far as the nomination, um, an appointment is required. Uh, you can get your uh, nomination through multiple routes. Um, and uh, Jennifer put on here, it's not as terrifying as it may seem. <laughs> Go to the next slide. <laughs> yeah. So there's different sources of nomination. Um, your Congress member, your either senators in your state, the vice president. Um, for Merchant Marine Academy, they do not accept vice presidential nominations. Um, US, US Post Guard Academy no longer requires a congressional nomination for appointment. Uh, for I, what I pulled up here was off of Senator Kamala Harris's site, um, what she requires from it. So you can go to uh, your local congressman site or your senators. Uh, one thing that she put on there is that if you you should apply for all options available to you because they have only a limited number of nominations that they can give per state. Um, so, but she did ask if you are seeking a nomination from another source that you also let her know or her team know um, because they want to, you know, they want to try to help as many students as possible, you know, reach their goal. Um, so basic eligibility requirements be between 17 and 23 years of age. Uh, I graduated high school at a 17 year old. My roommate at the academy was 21. So she had gone to George Washington University for two years, finally got in her third year. And um, so she had to start over as a freshman, but she could validate out of a lot of classes already that she had taken. Um, US citizen, legal resident of California for us, unmarried, uh, you cannot be pregnant nor legally obligated to support a child. Um, and that's for your whole four years. So you can go in and you cannot get pregnant while you're there. You can go in and you cannot be responsible for a child while you're there. Um, and then you must be able to be qualified to serve for five years of active duty service after graduation. Um, and then this is just kind of on her website, which she's requesting from each applicant. Um, so I just put that up there as something as an example, but uh, I would just urge you to go to each of your congressmen and senators websites and vice presidential and they'll walk you through what's requ you know, required for each. Awesome. Thanks, Tanya. And sorry, the picture somehow went over the email when I uploaded it. But when I send you the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see it. Um, Alrighty, thank you. We're gonna go ahead and move on and hear from Amy now. Hi everyone, my name is First Lieutenant Amy Slaughter. 
I graduated from West Point in 2016. Um, I spent a little bit of time in the Army as an engineer officer, and I got lucky enough to come back and work at West Point in admissions. So I help students every day navigate the application process. Um, all of the admissions teams at all of the service academies are here to help you. So if you have questions or you're confused, don't feel like you're bothering us. It's our job to help you. And um, we love working with students. So if there's things that you're confused about along the way, send us an email, give us a call, shoot us a text. Um, we're absolutely here to help you. Um, so as I told you, I work in the admissions office. West Point has a special diversity admissions office um, that works with underrepresented students. So that's where I work. Um, and I really enjoy kind of spreading this opportunity and, and sharing it with people. I grew up in North Ogden, Utah, so pretty close out west. I, I live in New York now, so it seems far away from home. Um, and I'd never heard of the service academies. I didn't really have an intention to serve in the military. I wasn't really interested um, in that sort of thing. And I got a letter in the mail from West Point, and my dad was like, wow, like, West Point is a really, really good school. Like it's an education almost as good as Harvard. Um, you're gonna become a leader out of there. You should check it out. So I went to a briefing much like the one we're giving you today. And I thought it sounded pretty interesting but I wasn't so sure about all the military stuff. Um, so I went to West Point. I went to this summer camp that they had for one week after my junior year. And I absolutely fell in love with the campus. And I think that the thing I enjoyed the most about it was being around so many different people from so many different walks of life, but they all had one very common goal, which was they wanted to be a part of a team. They wanted to make themselves the best version they could be, and they wanted to serve others. And I think you'll find that at all of the academies, not just West Point, but at the Naval Academy, at the Air Force Academy. Um, so that really made me fall in love with the campus. And from there on, I knew I really wanted to go to West Point. So diversity is a way of life in the military. Um, Maybe the statistics don't really seem that way, but uh, I think when we talk about diversity, a lot of people think about race, um, but there's a lot of different types of diversity at all of the service academies. So first and foremost, we have geographic diversity. We have students from every state at the academy and we are required by law to accept students from every state. So those congressional nominations we were talking about, um, allow us to pick the best students from every state. And we really want the student body at West Point to look like what it looks like in America, what it looks like in the army. Um, people from all different walks of life, whether you're from down south or out west or up north, um, whether you're brown, white, in purple, orange, green, we want, it, we want people from every walk of life in every um, part of the country. We also have students that come to West Point from overseas. So there are foreign cadets, there are students um, from a lot of different countries. So it's a it's a big melting pot where everyone learns from one another and everyone brings something different to the team. And that's what makes the army team or the US military the strongest power in the world. It's because all of our diversity brought together just makes us um, really, really strong. So uh, I think first and foremost, we should talk about geographic diversity. Um, we have gender diversity. Every time I talk to, you know, people that are older, they're really surprised, like, wow, you're in the military. I, I, you don't seem like someone that would be. Um, and I think uh, more and more we're seeing females in roles that are maybe that used to traditionally be male. So at West Point, we have about 23% women. And I think um, at the other academies, Air Force and Naval Academy, it's around the same percentage. I know the Coast Guard Academy is like 50%, which is incredible. Um, so the military kind of might seem like a guy's world, um, but there is place for women as well. Uh, we have women that are doctors, pilots, they're in the infantry, they're driving tanks. Um, I'm an engineer. So you have those same opportunities that males do. Um, and that's really exciting. Uh, and it's, it's all about what you can bring to the table. It's nothing about whether you're a male or female. So ladies, don't be nervous to apply to a service academy. Um, we have plenty of women there and more and more every year. So we have gender diversity as well. And then of course, racial diversity. Um, these numbers, this is kind of a pie chart. Uh, in, in green, you see Caucasian. In blue, it's African-American, red, Asian, um, uh, the gray is Hispanic. Um, we're not trying to fill a quota or, or have certain people, but we do want to see 
just a diverse set of students because when you leave an academy, you're going to serve as an officer in the Army, in the Navy, in the Air Force, or whatever branch of the military. And you're going to be leading a team of soldiers. And those soldiers are going to come from all over, from all sorts of different backgrounds. And we want the leaders uh, to be different and diverse, just like the soldiers are different and diverse, so that soldiers have the opportunity to connect with someone who looks like them or who comes from a similar background or has you know, similar cultural or family values. Um, so it's really important to us to have diversity of all types. Um, and we are committed to finding students um, from different backgrounds. I think the other thing that's really cool about West Point um, and the other service academies as well is that it's a completely free tuition. So whether or not you, your parents are multi-million dollar, multi-millionaires, or if you have 50 cents in your bank account, it doesn't matter. Um, everybody's expected to wear the same uniform. Everybody's expected to complete the same training and do the same hard classes. Uh, so you have no idea what whether you know the person next to you came from a really rough background or that came from a really wealthy background. We're all going through these challenges together um, and we all wear the same uniform at the end of the day. And so it doesn't matter where you came from, you can make something of yourself at an academy. And I think that's what's so great about it. Um, I loved my time at West Point. I feel like it changed my life. It changed the trajectory of my life. Uh, and there are a lot of incredible people that you'll meet uh, that are just having so many opportunities and doors open to them that they probably wouldn't if they didn't go to a service academy. And I think that's what's so special about the opportunity. It's it's all the doors could be open that you could possibly imagine. Um, so we'll go to the next slide, please. <clears throat> I don't know if I can change it. Okay, there we go. Um, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about the support we have for diverse candidates going through the admissions process. Um, so we have an outreach admissions office. That's where I work. Um, it works hand in hand with the, the regular admissions office, um, but we're focused on helping um, underrepresented students uh, find their way through the process. So we do events like this where we're speaking with students um, and we work with uh, that particular group of students to help them through. So if you are someone who is diverse, um, you'll work with the outreach office um, and all of the people that help on the admissions team are outstanding uh, and will help anyone in any way through the process. Um, but we do have an outreach office that works specifically with underrepresented minorities. Um, if you wanna talk a little bit about socioeconomic challenges, um, again, there's no need for any financial aid at, any of the service academies. There's no application fee. There is no tuition. There's no books. You can show up to West Point it, with the shirt on your back and nothing else, and we're gonna handle everything for you. You will get your computer, your printer paper, your books, your sheets, your towels, your uniforms, your running shoes, everything you could possibly need uh, at West Point will be given to you. And it is that way at all the academies. You're also getting paid a small bit while you're there. So a couple hundred dollars a month of funny money. Um, and that allows you to, you know, buy plane tickets home or buy junk food on Amazon or, you know, save your money if you're smart um, or, or even, you know, go take a weekend in New York City uh, and get a little uh, free time away from school. So um, in terms of those challenges, uh, that shouldn't be a hurdle for anyone. Um, and I think that's another huge attractant to the military academies. Um, we have a holistic admissions review process. Uh, Lieutenant Kim talked a little bit about that with the Naval Academy. It's the same at West Point. We want to find students that are well-rounded. And we really value characteristics like leadership, grit, perseverance. If you've overcome something really challenging in your life, or you have a really cool story, or your family has an awesome background, those are things that are important to us because they make they make for strong leaders that uh, have really good characteristics and that can lead people. So maybe you don't have a perfect 4-0, um, but maybe you had a really hard childhood and you were helping your mom raise your younger brother and sister and you had to work a job. That's something that we want to hear about. Um, and that's something that we value. And we can we can say, hey, you know, this kid was involved in all of these other things and he had all of these other responsibilities. And maybe he couldn't keep up quite as much as we would hope in school. But these are the reasons why um, we think he has the perseverance and the right attitude and the hard work ethic to make it here. Um, so tell your story. Don't be afraid to share 
um, some of those personal things about you because we really do look at those things along the way in the uh, application process. And those are things that we look at positively because um, we're looking for leaders. We're not just looking for people that are book smart or that are in really, really great shape. Uh, that doesn't necessarily gonna mean you're gonna be a great leader. So share those things in your application. Um, and one other thing I would like to talk about is uh, West Point's prep school. The other academies have this as well. Um, for students that fall a little bit short, let's say you have really um, great leadership skills and you are awesome at sports, but you really struggle taking tests. So your ACT and SAT aren't that great. Um, you might be a good candidate for prep school. So prep school is a one-year program where um, we help you improve on those areas that you're not the best at uh, to prepare you to succeed at West Point. So that's a one-year program. It's on West Point's campus. Again, it's very similar to West Point. It's completely paid for. You wear the same uniforms. It's the same kind of curriculum and campus culture. Uh, and you spend that year there as almost like a red shirt year to prepare you to succeed at West Point. Um, everyone who gets accepted into the preparatory school um, has a pretty much guarantee to get into West Point the following year. You just have to keep your grades up and stay out of trouble. So um, that would essentially be five years for your bachelor's degree. But that year at the prep school is really going to help you succeed and make up for any shortcomings you might have uh, so that you do well when you go to West Point. And again, they have those at each of the academies. So um, everyone applies to West Point at large or applies to the academy at large. And then the admissions team picks out people that they think would make good prep school candidates. So you don't apply to the prep school directly. You just apply to West Point. And if we feel prep school would be a good shot or a good choice for you, then um, we'll go ahead and, and select you for that. So if there are things you think, ah, oh, this, this sounds great, but you know, I don't have a 4.0. I, I haven't been the captain of my team. You know, we still have ways to kind of work around that. Uh, so I encourage all of you to open an application and apply um, because it can be done. And it's a hard application, but it's definitely worth it in the end. Um, lots of really great things going on with diversity at West Point. Last year, we had the largest number of African-American women graduate, 39. That picture right there of all of them. So when I graduated in 2016, there were only 16 of us. So to go from 16 to 39 in three years is pretty impressive. So things like that, um, West Point's really committed to diversity, really working on improving it. Uh, and as it was said before, there's a place for everyone at the academy. Uh, and we are just so excited to meet students from every walk of life. So I encourage you, if any of this sounds interesting, to please um, do some research and apply, and we're here to help you and answer your questions. Awesome. Thanks, Amy. Great things for um, everyone to consider and keep in mind. Um, so some final steps or last, last minute tips is, um, students, we do want to encourage you to um, keep an eye on your candidate portals. Um, your to-do list, you know, making sure that you're frequently checking them to make sure your um, lights are green or that your tasks are completed. Um, some things do get updated frequently, so stay on top of that um, when you're in the application process itself. Um, currently, you're not necessarily able to visit the academies right now, but um, in the future, if you can, this would be a great option. This is something that we definitely encourage of all colleges when students are, you know, considering which campuses or which route to take. Um, you can also do virtual tours. Um, I can include a link for that in a follow-up email as well. Um, and acceptances start rolling in in November with most in February, so keep that in mind. Um, so definitely keep an eye on your portal. That's where you'll hear whether you're accepted or rejected. And um, if you don't get in on the first shot, there's always next year. As Amy mentioned, you know, there's the prep school route. Um, I, I heard of the, the head of um, Mercedes-Benz USA. He applied three times before he got into West Point. Um, and once he did, he was already a junior at a different college. Um, but once he did apply, he got to start as a freshman or a, a plebe hopefully I'm saying that right, um, at West Point. And he did all four years there, right, as required, and um, is doing pretty well for himself um, after the fact, right? I mean, he's the head of Mercedes Benz. Um, so something to keep in mind, okay? So again, if you don't get into one of the academies right out of high school, 
you applied, you didn't get in, you can keep applying even when you're in college um, if you attend other colleges as well. Alrighty. Um, so next step, I would like to thank you all for sticking around. I know this is a long webinar, but I would like to ask if you could please um, do me a favor, scan this QR code one more time. This is for our post survey, just to kind of touch base, make sure that we're, you know, we're being helpful here. Um, helps definitely inform me um, for future programming as well. So if you could please take a moment to scan it and fill it out um, before we move on to the resource link slide and the Q&A portion of um, this evening. I'll give you maybe five more seconds. It's very short, very similar to the number of questions you answered at the very beginning. All right. Thank you for those that are taking the time to fill that out. Truly appreciate it. We're going to go ahead and move on. Okay, so this is one of the slides I was talking about. Um, so earlier we mentioned the ROTC path, which is definitely an option for students if that's kind of what you're more interested in. So in a follow-up email, I will include these slides where you can actually click on the links and it will direct you to different um, informational pages, um, including the different um, military academies. So you can definitely look into that. And I will include the link that Han mentioned earlier as well, along with some handouts that I was able to, to get. Um, I know Amy provided one. We have a US Naval Academy admissions tips handout that I will email you all as well. Um, all righty. So now we're, we're at the part where many of you have probably been waiting for. Um, this is where we can go ahead and start answering your questions. Um, so we've got quite a few here. We tried to answer some of the ones you all answer, uh, asked beforehand, um, but if we didn't get to them, please feel free to take this opportunity to ask now. Um, we're gonna go ahead and start with uh, the first question I can see, which is Natalie. Uh, what, oh, Okay, what role, if any, will athletic coaches play in the admissions process? Um, sorry, someone just asked a question and bumped that one down. Um, additionally, if a coach is recruiting you, do you still need to go through the whole nomination process and stuff? So I can answer that one. So you do have to go through the entire process, no matter what, if you're being recruited, you're still applying to the, the academy of your choice it helps you might get what's called a letter of assurance from the academy basically saying if you get the appointment you're getting in and they can help with you a little bit but you still have to apply to the academy and get in by yourself awesome thank you for answering that um i think sharon we might have answered that question right do athletes require an appointment form or from a senator or congressman yes um katarina if we are current juniors when do applications for military academies and ROT scholarships open up for us? Any important deadlines? Um, yes, I can talk about that a little bit. So the preliminary application for the Naval Academy is currently open. So if you if you follow that link to usna.edu, you can hit apply now and start the application. Uh, it's just gonna be preliminary information like your name, where you live, email address, and then middle of May, so this month in a couple of weeks, we're gonna send out further instructions to your email so that you can uh, create like a username and password and then complete the full application. Um, some important deadlines, so applications are open right now. If you don't open an application, the last day you can start an application if you're a junior is December 31st. And then all applications are due by the end of January next year um, and then for the nomination process that's like a almost like a second application to either your representative or your senator so the biggest thing to do is to find out first who your representative is and then the two senators for california go on their website and then see when their um, deadlines are because they're all going to be slightly different from each other and they're all going to have slightly different um, requirements so the biggest thing to do is go on their website and then look at all that information and make sure you're staying on top. Um, I would say the best time to start that is probably now or the fall. 
Great, thank you. Um, we also had another student ask, do any of the academies give students the ability to go on to medical school after graduation? So I can speak on that. It's the same for all of the academies. It's a very small percentage of the class, um, but if you have the grades, the test scores, and you get accepted, uh, you absolutely can go to medical school immediately upon graduation. When you do go to medical school, the Army or the Air Force or the Navy uh, will be paying for all of your tuition, room, board, books. Uh, you'll also receive your salary. But the trade-off for that is that you'll incur a longer commitment. So for every day you're in school, you owe a couple more days in the Army or in the Navy. Um, so you'll incur an additional uh, service obligation, but you'll go through medical school, you'll go through your residency, and then you'll serve in the Army, Air Force, Navy as a doctor for your obligation. So let's say you owe eight years after you finish medical school, you'll spend eight years in the Army as an Army doctor or eight years in the Air Force as an Air Force doctor in whatever you specialized in. Um, and you can go to any medical school you get accepted. So I have friends that went to Stanford and Duke. I also have friends that are at the military medical school uh, in Washington, D.C. So there's a lot of different options and there's absolutely support groups to help you um, make that dream a reality. I think the biggest hurdle is just keeping your grades up uh, and being eligible for medical school, having good enough test scores and having enough time to really work on those medical school applications your junior year. So absolutely go to med medical school. You'll have zero debt from undergrad and med school, you'll be getting a fat check while you're going to medical school, which most people don't get. So it's a great pathway, um, but you will be in the military a little bit longer than um, your classmates that graduated with you. Let me add, uh, let me add to it, uh, not just med school, you can also go to law school or any of these uh, grad and post-grad schools. And again, every day that you're in school, you will incur two days of obligation. Uh, again, the trade-off is all your tuition, room, board, everything's paid for, and you're getting a salary while you're in school. Awesome. Yeah, and I'll, I'll add on to that as well. So we have two programs at the Naval Academy, which um, opportunities for graduate education uh, after the Naval Academy. So VJEP, you can actually start, if you validate enough classes and you have a bunch of free space, you can actually start getting your graduate degree while you're a senior at the Naval Academy. Uh, and then you'll finish up about six months after graduation. Uh, and then about every year, about 20 people get picked up for IJEP, which is after you graduate from the Naval Academy, the Navy or the Marine Corps gives you two years to go get uh, your graduate degree from any school that you apply to. So a lot of people, um, we have Rhodes Scholars every, uh, you know, we have Rhodes Scholars, they, they have gone to Oxford, Harvard, Bunch of the Ivy Leagues. So if graduate school is something that you're looking for, that's definitely a possibility. Awesome. Thank you all for helping answer that question. Um, let's see, we have another question here um, from Madison. Hopefully they're still with us. If you're not in a leadership position right now, what are some ways you recommend to get involved? Um, so I can kind of answer that. You could really make a leadership position out of anything. For example, like if you're on a sports team, you could be head ball boy and you can try to manage a position where you delegate it to be one person every day and you're making a position out of something. It doesn't have to be like, I was, I was in charge of this entire big organization. It could be something simple. It's just getting the experience of leading people and knowing how to talk to them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, thanks for that, Alex. I know I've also worked with a student that was um, actually on the water polo team, but um, they got injured so they couldn't participate anymore. Um, so what they ended up doing was they would help with the stats, they would help um, record some of the games, right? So they, they were really still part of the team um, in that sense. So that's just another, um, another idea or another form of leadership you can consider as well. It's not always linked to a title, but think of it more as an action. Alrighty, we can move on to another question. Um, Thera, uh, so for juniors who are just now looking into military academies, is it too late? 
Absolutely not. Uh, junior year, especially early in your junior year, that's a good time to get get started. I didn't know anything about West Point until the summer of my junior year, and I was just fine. Um, we set up our application so that no one can really start doing anything major until they're seniors. So we do that by design so that everyone's on a level playing field. So the application opens the summer of your senior year, the full application, and that's when everyone kind of goes to the races. So you're just fine getting interested now. Um, do your research, work on staying in shape, uh, and your senior year is when we really start looking at students. So it's absolutely not too late. And I've even had seniors that started, you know, a couple months into their senior year of high school and got accepted because they worked really hard. So don't let that deter you. A lot of people take a long time and think about it from a very young age, but I didn't start until late in my junior year and I made it just fine. So you're, you're good. No worries. Great. And I have a question. I'm not too sure what they were asking. It says, so this only applies for college. So I'm not sure what part of the presentation you asked this. Um, could you enter any of these academies while in high school? Um, maybe this was at the beginning of the presentation. So um, we mentioned that the academies you can apply straight from high school, right? So that's definitely one route you can take. Um, if for whatever reason you don't get accepted, you can go on to apply um, to other colleges, attend college there, and you can continue to apply to the academies while you're in um, whatever college you attend. Um, that's definitely a route and a path you can take if you're determined and if your heart is in the academies. Hopefully that answered your question. It was a little vague. Jennifer, maybe the question was regarding, um, I think for enlisting, I think you can enlist okay. into the military during high school. So maybe that's what they were trying to clarify. But this is totally separate. Maybe, yeah, I'm not too sure, but that could be it too. That's another route you could take if you don't wanna go the academy route and you are just interested in still serving your country and being part of the military. Mm -hmm. Thanks for uh, adding, Tanya. Uh, let's see, we've got another question here. Um, how competitive is it to get the congressional nomination? I heard they're very selective. Also, if you apply for a nomination from all of them, how do they know not to nominate the same students as other members of Congress? Great question. Um, I can take this one. So. Uh, in terms of nominations that you could apply for, we recommend that you apply to as many as possible. So off, right off the bat, most people can apply to your local representative, your two senators for the state. Everyone can apply to the vice presidential. And then if you meet certain requirements, you can apply for the presidential as well. And the reason for that is um, it just gives you, it just gives the admissions team, admissions team like more options. So uh, there's a lot of competitive applicants that apply, but there are rules. I mean, only certain people or only a certain amount of people from each state and each congressional district can come into the academies each year. So the more uh, nominations that you apply for, uh, if we can kind of um, choose which nomination to use for the applicant so that we can get the highest number of uh, competitive applicants to come to the Naval Academy or West Point or the Service Academies. And we have an entire office dedicated to that process and that works directly with all the senators and representatives so that that process gets worked out. I was going to add on that or piggyback. Um, some states are more competitive than others. Obviously, um, you know, if you're in Maryland, there's a lot of people who are applying to the Naval Academy from that state. West Point, I'm assuming it's the same for New York. Um, so uh, I, you know, I went from Kentucky. Uh, I, most of the people in my state were looking at West Point um, just because there's a lot of army bases there. Um, and I will say just a plug for the Naval Academy. Um, when I said I was surrounded by West Point officers, they, uh, a lot of them advised me to go to the Naval Academy instead. And um, one of the things was look at where your duty stations are. Um, if you're somebody who likes to be by the water, look at the Naval Academy because your duty stations are mostly gonna be, you know, surrounded by water or by the water. Um, so there's some pretty, pretty nice duty stations. And where I grew up in Kentucky, I wouldn't consider that the nicest place. <laughs> so, so that's my plug. Good things to consider. Uh, let, let me add on to that too. Um, okay. <laughs> just, just so you know, um, 
this area, Southern California, is one of the more active regions where we get a lot of candidates for West Point. So if you plan on applying to West Point, especially in the Southern California area, start early and apply to as many um, sources for nominations as possible. Yeah, I just want to add on one more thing. And all this nomination, the application, it sounds pretty complicated and long and it's confusing. It's a lot of information. Uh, don't let that stop you. Um, don't be intimidated. If you're interested, I highly recommend that you apply because you really don't know what can happen. Um, so if you really are interested, please apply because like everyone's been saying in the presentation, we don't just look at one thing. We try to look at the entire application and try to hear your story. So uh, don't let all this talk of, oh, high SAT scores, high grades, oh, I'm not in a leadership position. Don't let that um, discourage you. I would encourage you to apply if you're interested. Uh, and please feel uh, free because to reach out with any questions. And I'm sure any person from any admissions team in the service academies will be willing to talk to you. So. I think every single person talked on this question, but I do want to add one other thing. Um, apply to all of the service academies. Maybe you really, really, really want to go to the Air Force Academy, um, but your state has more slots to go to West Point or go to the Naval Academy. Um, they're all outstanding opportunities. They're all pretty similar. So you may not get what you think to be is, is your dream school, but it still would be a incredible experience with a fully funded education. So apply to all of the service academies. If you're gonna do the work for one of them, you might as well do the work for all of them uh, because it is so similar. A lot of the requirements are the same across the board and you can use your fitness test from the Naval Academy. You can also send it straight to Air Force, straight to Army. Um, you would do the same thing for the nomination process. Uh, so apply to all of them and see, you know, where the cards fall uh, because they all do have very similar um, curriculums and and if you get accepted to any of the service academies it's a huge honor and a very exciting thing so apply to all of them don't just throw all your eggs in one basket uh, because you can share you're not them. stuck in one service or one job you can switch jobs within your career um, as you learn about different things and uh, apply for JAG or you know become a, 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 a lawyer um, and I have classmates who switch services. So uh, one of my classmates upon graduation didn't get a flight billet uh, through Navy, but he did through Air Force. He was commissioned an Air Force officer from the Naval Academy. It was a rare one, but you, you can move services. You can move jobs. You're not, you're not stuck in one thing. Yeah. Yeah. I was in flight school with a, a West Point grad. Um, he got picked up for the Marine Corps and became a Marine Corps helicopter pilot. We also had a guy from the Air Force Academy that was in flight school with us, Navy flight school. So like we have inner inner service transfers, probably like one or two a year. So it, it, it is a possibility for sure. OK, um, another great question here. Can you pass the medical exam with asthma? Uh, I'll touch upon that real quick. So. We are at the Naval Academy, at least the admissions counselors. We don't like to talk about medical uh, requirements because we're not trained medical professionals. So that is dealt with the medical team and it's done on a case by case basis where our doctor looks at your case and uh, Dodmer, which is a third party entity, they take a physical to make sure you're uh, medically fit uh, to go to the service academies. So we can't we can't answer case by case like, hey, you're good or you're not good. Uh, you're just going to have to go through the process, unfortunately. Um, but they are working, willing to work with you with whatever condition you have. So, um, yeah, we can't speak on that. Uh, it's a case by case basis. Yep. Alrighty, we have another medical related uh, question. Can a student still be considered with ACL surgeries? I would say the same yeah. answer to your, to your question. Okay, that one just. I had a, there were some some uh, classmates who actually had to have different knee surgeries uh, while there, and they were able to stay there. So, I mean, I can't answer obviously as you were saying too, but I mean things happen. You know, someone fell out of their bunk bed and like broke their arm, or you know, it's just can you continue with what's required? Um, okay, so let's see. Sorry, some questions are being asked a couple times, even though we addressed them. Um, 
I don't know if we answered this one earlier. Is anything different for varsity athletes at the academies? They get so more food. There's, <laughs> uh, not always. Oh, you guys thought you want so, to answer that, Alex? Yeah, I can. Uh, so there's kind of like a what you cut. So I think he's on mute. It's a, can You're you good. the rest of you hear me? Yeah. Okay. So there's a big division of what's called a NARP, which is a non-athletic regular person and a varsity athlete. <laughs> so there's kind of like two parties. I've been on both sides of them. At the end, you're all real good friends. But basically the one thing is you might get out of drill or parades or some mandatory events because you're a varsity athlete, but it's because you're at practice. So you might have you still are going to have a lot of military responsibilities. It's just you might focus more on, say, a practice, and then the next semester it's going to reverse, and you're going to basically have a normal military life again. All righty. And um, as a sophomore, when should we start looking at starting the application process? Great question, Trevor. Um, so go ahead, Amy. Oh. Um, so as a sophomore, again, we limit the amount of things you can do actually on your application until you're a senior, but it's not too early to start preparing. So as a sophomore, just again, work on your physical fitness, make sure you're taking challenging courses and getting good grades and try to get involved in clubs uh, and sports and seek out those leadership positions. After um, your sophomore year once you become a junior there's an opportunity at all of the service academies to go to something called summer leadership experience it's a one-week summer camp i talked a little bit about it in my um portion of the slides uh but you can come to the service academy spend a week you get to do like academic workshops some fun military stuff um you meet cadets and students you interact with the sports teams you get to stay on campus and eat the food and see what it's all about so i recommend that students that are sophomores, start looking forward to that your junior year. Um, and then just do your research and try and do your best to stay ahead academically, get good grades, take AP classes, um, and get involved in those clubs. But there's not a lot you can do until, again, your senior year um, to actually work on the application. But I highly recommend trying to go to those summer camps uh, this summer after your junior year um, to really get involved and see what it's all about. Mm -hmm. And we have a couple of people asking about ROT scholarships. How do they work and how do we apply? Um, so I actually applied for an NROTC scholarship as well when I was applying to the academy. Um, it's It's been a few years, so a lot of the details, I might not have the best information, but it's a, it's a separate application, um, similar requirements. Um, the best way to find out about that is if you Google NROTC scholarship, it should take you to the official Navy website. Um, and then um, if you look for it on that website, they'll have the link where you can uh, apply for the scholarship. Um, but the biggest thing is you apply for the scholarship and you can get it or not. And then separate from that, you apply to a four-year university or college that you want to go to that has a NROTC unit in it. And from there, you have to get accepted to the college and you get that, uh, and you apply for the scholarship. So it's a it's a two part application. Mm -hmm. um, okay, let's see. This is a kind of a personal question, but I respect and honor the fact that they asked this. Um, what chances would a junior have if he or she missed the entire first half of their junior year um, due to personal family issues? So um, <laughs> that's kind of tough, right? Everyone has a different story. You do have to have a completed high school transcript. So you have to graduate high school before coming to an academy. So I think it would just depend specifically on how classes worked out and if you got enough credits to fill out that high school graduation requirement. Um, that's something you'd certainly need to share with your admissions officer to kind of explain um, what happened, because if we saw a transcript where there was nothing for, you know, half a year, it might be a little confusing to us. So that's something you would have to work with your admissions officer on. 
I'm not going to say it's impossible, but I'm not going to say it's guaranteed either. You would just need to have enough of the classes and your high school um, diploma in order to move forward in the process. But again, these are the types of things that we're willing to work with students on and hear your story and get an understanding. So don't let it set you back. Um, if you have a specific question, call us, email us, and we can look into your specific case a little bit more. Yes, please do, because we're we're a little over time here. So we're just going to ask answer maybe a, a couple more questions. But feel free if we didn't address your question or you think of others, go ahead and jot down our email. I will also send out this PowerPoint once again um, in a follow up email. So please uh, keep in mind you can still access us. Um, a couple, actually a few students asked this question. Um, are A's in regular classes better than B's and C's in AP's and honors classes? What are y'all's thoughts on that? Hmm, that's a good question. I would say <laughs> it's really a case by case basis. And we try, like I said, we try to look at the application holistically and not just one aspect of it. Um, I would recommend that you strive to do the best that you can in your courses. Um, and I think there is, it, it, I think it's better to not overreach though and juggle too much that you can't handle where your, your performance um, goes down. So I think it's better to do what you can handle and be do very well at it than rather than trying to do too much and then you get your performance degrades. So. I can't definitely say one is better than the other, but I would recommend that, um, yeah, that you try to do the best that you can in your, not overreach is what I'm saying. Sorry, I don't know if that made sense. Yeah, I think, I um, I'd like, uh, I'd like to add on that. From, from what I understand is West Point would rather see you do let's say a B plus on an honors class. And then it's better than, not better, but it's more favorable than an A in a regular class. Now, if they, of course, you know, not just, not just if you get B plus all on all, all your classes or all, all your honor classes, that doesn't look, now Now you're overreaching like, like Lieutenant Kim mentioned. But if they see you have so much potential and you didn't take any risk at all, then that would also look unfavorable towards you also. So again, try your best, and, and they want to see you take some risks. Right. I think, I think the biggest thing that we look for is, hey, do you have the academic potential to succeed? So that's what we're trying to gauge. So it's not just Bs or Cs or As. We're looking at your SAT scores. That's a piece of information that we get. Uh, when you take AP courses or honors courses and your performance on that, we gauge, hey, can they succeed academically at the Naval Academy academic environment? So that's really the thing that we're looking for. So you might have a B or you might have a C, but then, you know, we see like an upward trend. So it goes from a C from trig, then you take pre-calculus, you get a B, AP calculus, senior year, you get an A. So that to us signals, hey, this candidate has the potential to, to succeed. So that's really what we're looking for. And if you meet that, if you meet that requirement, then that that works for us. All right, we're going to take one last question. Um, how do you balance academics, sports and all the military duties? You guys are going to learn a lot about time management. That's the request for us from Alec to answer this as a water polo player. I just got a text from one of the students listening in. <laughs> um so yeah you're gonna have a lot of time management it's gonna be you're gonna do all your stuff in the morning you're gonna have all your classes you're gonna have practice and the second you get back from practice you're gonna have to go do all your homework and then you're gonna do it again so it's really just getting a regular schedule that you're used to and you know that works for you but it's being able to budget those five extra minutes or cut off 10 minutes off of making your bed or getting changed. So you have an extra 10 minutes to study. And you'll learn that all over like summer when you do rack races or uniform races and all that stuff. And you guys might think it's stupid, but you're gonna realize when you get through the academy, those all did teach you lessons and it was all about time management. 
Great, thank you. Um, I think there's one more question that we haven't addressed that pop just popped up. Do the academies use weighted GPA or only straight 4.0 GPA? I guess weighted or unweighted is the question here. We, we use weighted GPA at West Point. We look okay. at both, whatever you pro provide. So. Okay, awesome. Great. Um, so thank you all for asking wonderful questions. Thank you for speakers sharing their time. Time is very valuable. Um, we do appreciate you all joining us. Um, so with that said, I want to say thank you once again to everyone. And I'm going to go ahead and um, end this webinar now. Um, so goodbye. Thanks again to our speakers. Um, have a great night. Take care. Bye, everyone. Go Navy beat Army. <laughs> Bye-bye. <laughs>